Well, a good morning and welcome to all of you this Lord's Day. Grateful to see you as we gather together and worship today. Let me give you an update on folks we're praying for, as well as the announcements regarding our church. Again, many to be praying for, either in our congregation or connected to our congregation that do have COVID-19. Phil Boltz's mother, you mentioned that to us uh, Wednesday night. Also, Miss Ava who would normally be with us, but is home with it, feeling very fluish with this case of coronavirus. Nancy Smith, good to see you, though. Thank the Lord for you being back with us. We keep praying for David Hislop, who, as you've seen from the text, is progressing well in terms of his dependence on oxygen. So slow steps, but good steps in the right direction. So very thankful uh, for Dale, or excuse me, for David. Mel Duncan's home. Feels about 50%, so we will take that. And then, of course, we uh, want to continue praying for Mary Gamble. Sadly, don't have good news uh, in that area. She's done uh, very poorly in terms of health and families having to think about uh, ventilator versus hospice discussions. So keep her family in prayers. Pray that God might be merciful to her. Still turn uh, this situation around for his glory. So let's keep praying for all those folks. Second, I do bring a good report from our Presbytery meeting yesterday. I thank you for all of your prayers. Several of you have asked and assured me of your prayers, both for me serving as moderator and the, the Presbytery meeting. It went really, really well, thank the Lord. It went really, really fast, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it helps that we had a very easy docket. So normally I'd give you a report in the morning or evening and tell you all the things that happened. And there's really not a whole lot to tell you because things were so Simple. There were no new incoming pastors this term. We did have Dale officially become an intern in Calvary Presbytery at the meeting yesterday. We heard reports from our church plants, which we thank the Lord, and especially in this time. Uh, church plants growing, doing well, even beginning. So thank the Lord for those and, and keep praying for all the church plants. We put them there uh, in the prayer bulletin. And perhaps one big takeaway was we had Lloyd Kim visit the Presbytery. He's the national director of Mission to the World. So, you know, who's over missions in the PCA, so to speak, nationally? It was Lloyd Kim. And he came and gave a good talk about the need for missions, the need for missionaries. We, we don't see as many people going uh, to the mission field, perhaps, as we used to in previous generations. And, and he implored the churches to still... Uh, make that a focus and a priority for the church. So I, will, I want to pass it on to you and, and say, if you've ever thought about missions, if you have any interest in any kind of missions work, whether you're young or old, we, we've had reports in this church before from uh, when Logan and Noah did missions trips and things like that. If, if that's a part of your burden and, and you just want to know more, like what is there to do missions-wise in the PCA, then talk to me. Because I'll put you in touch with these folks and our regional coordinators, and they'll tell you, here's short-term trips, long-term trips, second career opportunities. So if God stirs you or moves you in that way, or playing off the message Dale preached a few weeks ago, uh, then see me, and we'll, we'll be happy to encourage you in that work. Other announcements, let me give these quickly. The baby bottle boomerang we do each year with Carolina Pregnancy Center, raising money for them. The bottles are there in the Narthex. If you'd rather give online, they do have that set up, and I'll get you the, the information if you'd like to give in that way. We have the February Table Talk magazines also in the Narthex, and then Jonathan Maccabee has been giving out the financial reports, contribution statements, and other year-end budget material. So if you didn't get that when he came in, he has that information for you. Well, let's turn and look at the front of our order of worship then. We have Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12. Let me read this passage. God calls us to worship through his word. Let's hear his voice. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. 
Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken. Two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love, and you reward everyone according to what they have done. Come, let us worship the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for new morning mercies. We thank you that uh, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We celebrate your mercy. We rest in it, especially as we pray for the folks that are in need and Give thanks for what you have done to provide, to, to bring some out of the valley of the shadow of death, and to be faithful as others may be entering that valley. To give grace to your people, to give help and mercy in time of need. You're faithful. To give hope even in the midst of darkness, and to give your people a purpose and a mission of glorifying you and serving you. We thank you that all of our times are in your hands, and you are faithful, you are good, no matter what you do. And you are sufficient for us when we sense our need of you. We see that here in this psalm, that you are the rock, our rest is in you, our hope comes from you, our salvation and honor depend on you, and we ought to trust in you at all times. Forgive us for when we have not done that. And we praise and adore you and magnify and glorify you because you are faithful and good. And we pray that during this time you would be exalted. You would receive all the honor and all the praise. Our eyes spiritually would be fixed on you and that you would be magnified. We praise you. We thank you for all of your attributes and we pray to you because Lord you have been there for us and you have instructed us. You have taught us to pray and to call on you as our Father who are in heaven. So I pray hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turn with me this morning to Psalm 1, the Old Testament book of Psalms. I remember as a kid being in church, if you just let your Bible open in the middle, it tended to fall in the Psalms, which always made it easy to find. That was the book that you were going to be in. So Psalm 1, if you can find Psalms, just go back to the beginning. And in a moment we will read the words of Psalm 1. I do want to take a moment to pray for the folks we've mentioned folks on our prayer list, of folks that stand in need, and to give thanks to God for the mercy he has shown. So let's go before the Lord again and call upon him for these needs. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we do thank you greatly for your kindness. We do thank you much for your grace. We thank you for being good and answering prayer. 
We thank you for uh, the answer to prayers we've seen with David Hislop. We thank you that we've seen a lot of good improvement, movement in the right direction, which is exactly what we asked you for. You have been pleased to give it. That came from you, so we give you glory. It would have been good no matter what you did. You chose to answer the prayers of your people. We thank you. And now we pray that would continue. There'd be no setbacks or reversals, but that he might continue to heal well. Thank you for his own testimony of what you have taught him, what you have shown him through your word, how you have drawn close. Now he has been made more holy, even in this time of difficulty. While we are thinking of, of him getting better and living, Lord, you have been at work in his soul. And we thank you very much for that. We praise you for uh, meeting that need. We all, uh, this sickness is always a reminder of the state of our souls. And without grace, we are dead. We need you for eternal life. We thank you that you are gracious and give it. Lord, we do pray for Phil Boltz's mother. We do pray for Ava. We thank you that Nancy Smith is back with us today, that Mel is doing better. Pray for these other folks that they would make a full recovery. And we pray especially for Mary Gamble. We pray you might still, at this hour, even be pleased to spare her life and to show her mercy. We pray you give to her husband and family great comfort. And may they have wisdom as they have to make these difficult decisions about her care. Lord, draw near and show mercy through Christ, that they may do what pleases you and live and act for your glory and honor. We do thank you for the good meeting at Presbytery yesterday. I thank you for the way you care for your church, that we can gather together as churches here in the upstate of South Carolina and do uh, the work of missions and church planting, trying to advance the mission of the church to see more people saved, discipled, identified with Christ, brought into the church, and taught to obey you. That's why you came. That's our mission. And I pray we would pursue it well. Forgive us where we pursue it poorly. Forgive us of where we sin. Thank you so much for the provision you give to us. Thank you for the provision you've shown to this church. As, as Jonathan's email celebrated, that you provided above and beyond our needs, even in a year in which that would not have been expected. Thank you. You are kind. We give you our thanks and recognize that it comes from you. So now we come to your word, feed our souls, make Christ precious to us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 1, God's word reads, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Amen. Martin Luther once described the book of Psalms as follows. The Psalter ought to be a precious and beloved book. If for no other reason than this, it promises Christ's death and resurrection so clearly and pictures his kingdom and the condition and nature of all Christendom that it might well be called a little Bible. In it is comprehended most beautifully and briefly everything that is in the entire Bible. It is really a fine Enchiridion or handbook. In fact, I have a notion that the Holy Spirit wanted to take the trouble himself to compile a short Bible and book of examples of all Christendom for all saints so that anyone who could not read the whole Bible would here have anyway almost an entire summary of it comprised in one little book. Luther describes the Psalms as a little Bible. And his comment reflects the breadth of the Psalms. The idea that here, this big book in the middle of our Bibles, connects with everything else in the rest of the Bible. And Luther's right. He does. The, the themes stretch out and interconnect with everything else in the rest of Scripture. So they have a great breadth. 
But not only do the Psalms have a great breadth, they also have great depth. So John Calvin called the book of Psalms an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. And the church father Athanasius wrote, In the other books, one hears only what one must do and what one must not do. But in the book of Psalms, the one who hears, in addition to learning these things, also comprehends and is taught it in the emotions of the soul. And consequently, he is enabled by this book to possess the image deriving from the words. Simply, Calvin and Athanasius are reflecting the fact that the Psalms are poetry. And because they are poetry, they tend to touch all the different parts of a person in a way that other genres, such as narrative or law, do not. There's nothing wrong with the other genres, but as humans, we get communicated with in different ways, and God speaks to our minds and our souls in all manner of ways. And sometimes poetry can go to a depth and show you things that other forms cannot. And maybe you've experienced this from the Psalms. Maybe there's been times where you were troubled in soul, and, and so you turn to the Psalms to give voice to your prayer. It's common for people to say that the Psalms express the full range of human emotions before God. So, for example, the hymns of praise, they shout out the soaring joy of those who bear witness to God's faithfulness. The prayers for help, Give voice to the groaning pain of those who long for but cannot find a faithful God in their suffering. The Psalms of trust express the confident inner faith of those who trust in spite of the quaking realities all around them. The songs of thanksgiving ring with the renewed song of those who have passed through a dark valley of crisis. The instructional psalms pass on the wisdom of those who have gone before to generations yet unknown. The imprecatory psalms cry out for justice against those who oppress. And finally, the royal psalms bear witness to the mystery that God has chosen human beings as the agents through which God is at work in a broken world. And maybe you've done that before, prayed through the Psalms or read those when you, when you face those different needs. You think of the way we prayed just a moment ago, rejoicing for some doing well, asking God for mercy for others, thanking him for what he does and trusting him when he doesn't do as we might expect. It's no wonder that countless believers throughout time have prayed these Psalms. Not only have they prayed then they've been sung in the ancient worship of Israel and throughout the Christian church. And so because of this breadth, because of this depth, I think it's time we finally came to the book of Psalms. And I want to spend two or three months preaching through selected psalms from this great book. We won't preach every psalm, but we'll preach enough to give us a taste for the riches of this central book. And maybe even the, the Psalms we look at, that, that will inspire your own study to look more at the Psalms or to use them in your own worship, your own times of prayer. But before we begin to look at the individual Psalms, Psalm 1 and 2 and, and 51, as Dale looked at some weeks ago and whatnot, before we look at the individual Psalms, there is another level of meaning that I want us to consider. Ordinarily, when you study a book of the Bible, you'll try to discover its main idea and how the big sections of the book develop that idea. The Psalms may appear to resist that approach. After all, for no other reason, it's a huge book, 150 Psalms. But also you have the fact that the Psalms have many different authors. They were written over the course of many hundreds of years. It is poetry, as we've already said, not a narrative book, so it doesn't appear to have a central plot. It's not a letter like Paul's letter to the Romans, where, where it's clearly developing one theme, such as the Gospels. In fact, maybe you've struggled with this. I remember thinking this at different times in the past. 
Sometimes a psalm is read and it just sounds so general or generic. It appears to lack any kind of historical grounding that would really make it help it feel more tangible uh, to connect to our daily lives. Being general, you, you can open anyone and pray it. And at other times, it can seem so generic that you're like, okay, well, what's going on here? What is the point of the psalm? So despite those obstacles of the fact that it may appear to defy a big idea, we can propose an overarching story that the psalms are telling. A story with a particular message for us to embrace. And as I think you'll see, one that is very relevant connects very much to our daily lives and where we find ourselves living as God's people. So what I want to do today is present the evidence that there is a unifying theme and give you the outline for that story. And that way, when we come to the selected Psalms over the next few weeks, we can better grasp their individual message and also see how they develop the larger story. So first, let's look at the evidence for an intentional big idea in the Psalms. What this means is today we're going to be very broad in looking at the Psalms. We'll dig deep next week into Psalm 1 and other Psalms in weeks to come. But I do want to give you the evidence for an intentional big idea in the Psalms. And, and I'll admit this. I want to do this because when I first heard about this concept, I was skeptical. To me, it seemed, you know, trying to unite the Psalms under one big theme, that just seemed like a real stretch. Like someone's trying to force a big idea onto the Psalms and it's just not going to fit. It's not going to fit all the data. And maybe they mean well, that they want to make it more applicable. They want to connect it uh, to the rest of the Bible. But it just seemed like they were trying to get the Psalms to say more uh, than they really did. Maybe you've thought that when you've heard this idea. So what I want to do is just share with you some of the arguments uh, that I read. When I actually started to read on the topic, it ended up being very enlightening. Let me just give you a few of the things that I've found. As we've already mentioned, the Psalms have several different authors. So at least one Psalm is attributed to Moses, Psalm 90. Several Psalms, as you probably know, the majority in fact, are attributed to King David. Now, David's 400 years after Moses. So that's kind of like where we are now in America compared with Jamestown. That's a long period of time. And then several of the Psalms appear to reflect the time of the exile, when no Davidic king sat on the throne and Israel was taken away into Babylon and later returned. So from Moses to the exile, that's a time span of a thousand years. But despite the variety of authors, despite the different backgrounds, and despite all that time, how do we have the Psalms? They've come down to us as a unified whole. They sit in your Bible as a collected book. And not only have they been collected, but when we look at the collection itself, they have identifiable patterns of arrangement. So not only do you have the inspired authors writing the Psalms, God breathed them out, and Jesus and the apostles affirmed that. But not only are the inspired authors writing the Psalms, as Israel, as God's people, received these scriptures... And all of that was under the providence of God. They collected them, they arranged them, and they did it in specific and intentional ways. So what are some of those ways? Well, for starters, the Psalms, 150 Psalms, are arranged into five books. So that alone is a sign of an intentional collection. But not only that, the size of the five books is significantly uneven. So book one contains 41 psalms, but books 3 and 4 only contain 17 in each book. Furthermore, most of David's psalms have been front-loaded to book 1. Now, more do come up later in the psalm, but they're really heavy in book 1. So all this indicates that they've been arranged and collected in a specific way, not haphazardly, 
but intentionally. Furthermore, you have collections of psalms by the sons of Korah, Psalms 42 to 49, and, and later as well. You have the psalms of Asaph, Psalms 73 to 83. The songs of ascents, Psalms 120 to 34. And the hallelujah psalms, where they say hallelujah over and over again, Psalms 111 to 118. These kinds of groupings are signs that they just didn't get thrown together haphazardly, but they were intentionally arranged. And that's all, that's all I'm going to give you in that area. I've got more if you want the notes and you want to see other evidence of organization. So here's how one author has described it. This is like footprints in the sand. Granted, when you start to read the Psalms, the big idea may not overwhelm you. That's why I said it. It might almost seem like a stretch. But when you start looking closely, you start seeing some footprints here. And the question is, can we follow these footprints and discover the intention behind the arrangement? I think we can. So what is that message? Let me give that to you now. What we've got to do is we really have to fly over the Psalms and just examine their flow. And then we'll draw some conclusions. I'll read from several selections of the Psalms here. So just follow as we kind of overview their flow and then try to tie all the threads together. We did read from Psalm 1 this morning because that, those are the words that open the Psalter. And the Psalms open with words that encourage godliness based on God's word. So Psalm 1, the opening verses read, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Now that opening word, bless, you'll find that shot throughout the entire book of of Psalms, and it refers to the happiness that comes from holiness. And don't get tripped up over the word happiness. I don't mean it there in the sense of being bubbly or you're a person that's always in a good mood. We don't mean in a feelings sense of the term. We mean happiness in the sense of being spiritually alive. How this psalm describes it you bear spiritual fruit, you endure throughout difficulties. Uh, the people that are blessed, according to the Psalms, are those who experience well-being in their life. But again, not just that everything goes well. Rather, they have joy. They have satisfaction. They're in an enviable position. And how do you get to be in that enviable position? It is because they are hearers and doers of God's word. Their happiness flows from their holiness. And the Psalms are going to have so much to say about how to live the happy, holy life on the basis of God's word. That's one of the foundations of the Psalter. Psalm 2 then gives us another foundation for this kind of life. We have God's word. Psalm 2 gives us God's reign. Those who live the happy and holy life do so from the conviction that God controls everything. Look at how Psalm 2 ends. Verse 12, it says, Kiss his son, or he will be angry. And your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed, same word, so you see it's like bookends. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So Psalm 2 develops this idea. God is going to bring his reign from heaven to earth. But one big obstacle stands in the way. The sinful nations who oppose God and his king. 
So God makes a promise. He promises his son. And as we see in 2 Samuel, this involves David. He promises that David, through your line, God's reign will come to earth. It will come from heaven to earth, and God will be king. So by the way, you see how Psalm 2 is already tying in to the larger biblical storyline. A story that goes all the way back to Genesis 3, the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent, the righteous and the wicked who will be in perpetual conflict, and one who will come to win the war, to conquer the enemy. Psalm 2 says that's going to come through David. God's reign's coming to earth. The sinful nations are in the way, but you'll be blessed if you take refuge in God's Messiah. So you can have a happy, holy life. You can have refuge in the Son of God. God's word and God's reign provide the foundation for the kind of life that pleases God. And he's going to show you all this through his plan, especially in David. But Psalm 3 introduces a problem. Psalm 3 identifies itself as a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. So David is going to subdue the earth. David can't even subdue his own house. How is God's promise going to come to pass through him? Small wonder then that book one of the Psalms is full of Psalms of lament, particularly individual lament. David is God's representative. He is the forerunner of God's Messiah and he is throughout his life engaging in mortal combat with the enemies of God. These enemies may be found among the Philistines. These enemies may be found in Israel, like Saul. Or these enemies might be found in David's own home, his son, Absalom. God made a promise. And yet David experiences conflict. And you have all this lament in book one. Despite the conflict, Psalms assures us that the promises being made to David are in process of being fulfilled. And so listen to how book one ends with these words from Psalm 41. Blessed, there it is again, blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He does not give them over to the desire of their foes. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. This sounds like God has vindicated David, that he has given him rest from some of this conflict. In fact, David says, you are pleased with me. That's the same word as delight. Here in Psalm 1, you see, David has made the choice to delight himself in God's word, to be a doer of that word, to rest in those promises. And because David delights in the word, Psalm 1, he has triumphed over his enemies, Psalm 2. And so book 1 ends with David beginning to inherit the nations. Now book 2 will continue these themes, and yet it will advance the storyline in terms of Israel's kingdom. So if you were to come to the end of book two, you would find Psalm 71. And Psalm 71 contains many references to old age. Some say it sounds like the words of an aged David at the end of his reign. And then, get this, in Psalm 72, the very next psalm and the last book of Psalm, uh, the last psalm of book two, it's the only psalm in the Psalter ascribed to Solomon, David's son, his heir, who continues his reign. And Psalm 72 describes Solomon as one who cares for the weak. Does that sound familiar? It's because Psalm 41 just describe David in the same way. So the book, the psalm that ends book one and the psalm that ends book two both describe this blessed king who is reigning over the nations, 
because he delights in God's word. But the story is actually taken a step forward from David to Solomon, showing that God is continuing his reign. Later people will enjoy what David enjoyed because they will do what David do, did. They will delight in God's word, and so they will experience Psalm 2. Now, book 3, however, is where things start to fall apart. Book 3 begins with Psalm 73. This is a psalm of Asaph. He was a temple singer during the reigns of David and Solomon. And so you, you just sense a shift of focus from David to Solomon and later generations, going out beyond the kingship here and beginning perhaps to give us the voice of the people in Israel. Now, as you know from the historical books, books like 1 and 2 Kings, the kings after Solomon, for the most part, were abject failures. They were wicked. They rejected God's word, and they suffered his displeasure. Small wonder, then, when Psalm 73 complains, why do the wicked prosper? Why do the righteous suffer? One author has noted, community laments dominate book three of the Psalter. And it makes sense, doesn't it, when you think about the history and the way it might tie into the story of this book. With David gone, with Solomon gone, the church, Israel, they're trying to make sense of all the chaos around them and all the wicked rulers that have arisen to do harm there in Israel. How does Solomon's reign end? The kingdom is divided into two rival kingdoms. They are being harassed by surrounding nations. Eventually they will go into exile. And so Psalm 88, towards the end of the short book three, Psalm 88 speaks of God's overwhelming anger. Psalm 89, which is a royal psalm, it celebrates the covenant that God made with David. And yet the author also laments, God, you have rejected us. You have spurned us. You have been very angry with your anointed one, with your Messiah. What happened to Psalm 2? Well, Psalm 2 isn't being realized because Psalm 1 isn't being practiced. And again, you, you think about the Psalms we just referred to it and put them against the background of Israel's destruction in 722 BC, Judah's exile in 586. Each psalm starts to get a little more specific, and you see how we can appreciate this big theme that is greater than the sum of its parts. So let's begin to land our, in, our airplane. Book four, catch this, this is, this, is help, this is edifying for us. Book four begins to instruct God's people on how they can respond to such devastation. Book 4 opens with Psalm 90. This is the only psalm directly attributed to Moses. Why put a psalm of Moses here in book 4? To remind the people, you found refuge in God before David. You can find refuge in God after David. Remember, with Moses, the people sinned in the desert and God forgave them. The people who have sinned leading to the exile, God will forgive their descendants. There is hope for the future and there is still a plan and purpose moving forward. Now, don't, mis don't make this mistake, though, as, as book four shows us. God's forgiveness does not mean that they go back to the days of David. Those days are gone. And sometimes when we repent of our sins and we go before God for mercy, we think, okay, God will just roll back the clock. Everything will go back to the way it always was before. No, Psalm 4, book 4, I mean, gives a better message. All those, those days are gone. God himself is your king. And you find a higher concentration in book four of psalms that don't refer to David as king. They point directly to the fact that God is your king. And that is what would give the people hope for the future. And so Psalm 105, it reminds the people of how God cared for them throughout their history. It's one of those psalms that goes through Israel's history and highlights how God cared for them. Psalm 106, which ends book four, 
It reminds the people of their unfaithfulness to God throughout that history, thus telling them this, remember the past and obey in the future so that you can once again enjoy God's care and reign. And so book five brings the Psalter to a conclusion. And here's how it does it. Psalm 107 opens book five. This is a community hymn. And it celebrates God's graciousness in delivering people from perilous circumstances. Guess who makes a dramatic reappearance in Psalm 108? It's a psalm of David. And so once again, the theme emerges that God will fulfill his promises, that God will advance his reign, that Psalm 2 can be enjoyed. In fact, Psalm 5 contains several little groups of Psalms of David. Not, not every Psalm is a Psalm of David, but it's higher here than it has been since books 1 and 2. Several of the Psalms in, the book, uh, in book 5 are those used at Israel's major feast, their annual feast, when they all got together and praised the Lord for his salvation and his mercy. The last Psalm of David is Psalm 145. And it is a masterful psalm that celebrates God's kingship over his community and God's kingship over his creation. What God promised in Psalm 2 is finally coming to pass. And so the whole book of Psalms ends with five psalms of praise. Five books, five psalms of praise. For all that God has done. That's the story. The arrangement indicates we should follow the footprints in that way. So what's the message? It's this. God, despite the failures and sins of the past, despite the changes in the present, will be the God of his people. And he will fulfill all that he has promised them. What is the takeaway for us? Psalms shows you how to live as God's holy, happy people while we wait for his promises to be fulfilled. In other words, Psalms not only tells you a story, Psalms tells you how to play your part in that story. Psalms is a script, which means it's telling a story and it's giving you instructions in the theater on how to perform your part in God's story. So do you lament the sins of the past? Do you worry about changes in the present? Do you wonder what the future holds? If so, then the Psalms were written for you. This is the book that God gave Israel to forge their identity as the people of God, and particularly to forge that identity or even to remake that identity when their past had been destroyed. It enabled them to press forward as God's worshiping, faithful, believing community as they waited for God's promises to come to pass. On this side of the cross, we have the great benefit of knowing who it is that brings these promises to pass. We live in the time when God's reign has actually begun, when it's been definitively inaugurated, when it's taken that massive definitive step forward with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the Israelites under the Psalter, we are still waiting for it to come to pass completely. And so we need the Psalms. We need them to show us how to obey. We need them to show us how to lament. We need them to show us how to pray. We need them to show us how to celebrate. We need them to show us how to praise God, who gives his people a happy, holy life under the reign of our great king. 
So let's give thanks and pray to that end. Father in heaven, we thank you for the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, who before he ascended into heaven said that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth and commissioned us to go disciple the nations, to participate in Psalm 2. Lord, in order to do that, we need your word. We need to be people who delight ourselves in the law of the Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that you would change us in that way, that, that where we do delight in the Lord, you would fan that into an even greater flame. We pray that where we delight in other things, you would throw water on that. We pray that where there is no delight in the Lord amongst the congregation, that you would awaken it, that you would begin that fire. And Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us when we have not done these things and help us to fix our eyes wholeheartedly on the reign of God and to live out your word. Lord, we pray especially again for all those who are in need. We pray they, even as they suffer from COVID, even as they fear the end of life, or as they wonder how long it will take to get better, that they would do it with a view towards the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even now, they would delight themselves in the law of the Lord, and they would wait upon you to see what you would be pleased to do in them. Thank you for all the mercies you show us, and thank you for your great grace. And go with us uh, throughout the rest of this day and in the week to come. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And go now with God's blessing. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us, and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. May he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. <laughs>